You have to enjoy the electronic age when it works. I think we're having some troubles. Uh, Jeff is going to try to uh, get it to work from the back. Ah, okay. We have uh, this evening questions and answers, as uh, you can uh, probably tell. And we're going to deal with a question that deals with the seven churches of Asia Minor. Uh, the question that was uh, asked, and this is the first of uh, four that we're going to deal with, in Revelation 2, 1, 8, 12, 18, 3, 1, 7, and 14, Jesus is addressing the church in, what does, or the angel of the church in, what does that phrase mean? Does this imply that South Seminole has an angel assigned to it? Or does the word translated angel mean something else other than an angelic being? All right, well, we'd like to deal with this. In Revelation 1, as uh, you saw part of it revealed, we have a symbolic description of Jesus. And then he explains what a couple of the symbols stand for in Revelation 1 and verse 20. The seven lampstands are the seven churches, and the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And of course, we're concerned with who are those seven angels. In his commentary on uh, Revelation, published uh, back in 2011, Tom Waycaster gives an excellent summary of some of the views that have been uh, given over time. Some think the angel represents the essential nature of the congregation, its spirit. I wouldn't rule that out, but it doesn't seem to fit all that well. A better description, a better idea, is that it refers to the leadership of the congregation. Well, whether elders, preachers, or whoever, uh, if there are neither, uh, those who are responsible for uh, what is being done in the direction of the congregation. Now, this makes sense since the elders are to watch for the safety of the congregation. Uh, remind our, let's remind ourselves again of uh, Acts chapter 20, beginning with verse 28. Therefore, uh, Paul says to the elders at Ephesus, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So there is a watching out that must be undertaken by the leadership of the congregation. In the absence of elders, it's something that the men must do. Uh, in uh, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, we also have a charge uh, made to those who are in a position of influence in the church. We read, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. As those who must give an account, let them do it so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So, uh, yes, there are overseers. They do watch out. For the souls of men. Now, a third explanation is that the angel refers to a preacher 
or evangelist who is working with a congregation. And yes, the word angel does mean messenger, someone bearing news. Now, quite often it refers to spiritual beings with God, those angels, but it is also used of those who bring a message. And uh, so it could refer to uh, an evangelist, for example, because he brings a good message with him. And we might ask the question as we try to figure this out, did, did all seven congregations have elders? No, there's no mention that all seven did. Did all seven have preachers? Well, there's, there's no mention, unless, of course, that's what this is referring to. Uh, did some have preaching elders? Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17. Uh, you might overlook this if you're not careful. But in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. So there were some who were, had a dual role in the congregation of being both elders and preachers. So uh, the uh, second interpretation would, encomp uh, would encompass all of these various possibilities for leadership, elders, uh, having a preacher, having an elder who is also a preacher. Uh, so yes, in order to answer the question, yes, we and all other congregations have an angel. All right, now let's go to the second question. How many years between the first crossing of the Jordan and the return to their families on the east side? Now, you'll remember that uh, Reuben and Gad and a half-tribe of Manasseh wanted to have uh, some of the territory on the, the east side of the Jordan River. They asked for their inheritance to be there, but uh, Moses says, well, you can't just stay here while your brothers go to war. Uh, you've got to go fight. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. When that is accomplished, then we'll come back. So this question is asking, basically, how long was that from the time they crossed over to the time they come back? Now, the crossing is recorded in Joshua chapter 3. And uh, it's later in Joshua chapter 13 that they begin dividing up the land. However, the amount of time is not specified in those chapters. However, we do have a way of knowing. In Joshua chapter 14, verse 7, we have uh, information about uh, Caleb. And here's what he says in Joshua uh, 14 and verse 7. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea, to spy out the land, I brought back word to him uh, what was in my heart. And of course, as you know, uh, at that time, they rejected going up and taking the land. So Caleb had to spend 40 years in the wilderness, just like Joshua. And uh, then they got the opportunity to go conquer the land. Now in Joshua chapter 14 and verse 10, Caleb says, And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive all these years, 45 years ever since he spoke the word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And today I am 85 years old. So he was 40 years old when he was sent out. He was 85, so that means that they were over there fighting about five years. If he rounded it off. Uh, he uh, was commissioned as a spy after they had already left Egypt for one year, because this happened just after uh, the, the Passover that they observed after being out of Egypt. So uh, if he was not rounding off, he was technically 39, 
and that would make it six years' time. So either five or six years is the answer to the question. Next, we want to do a follow-up to a question that was asked in November of last year, or answered at least, in November of last year. And that question was, in the November 18th issue of Seek the Old Paths, there is an article on page 87 that discusses the dangers of the New King James Version. Any comments? Yeah, I made quite a few at the time. And I pointed out, basically, that there are some uh, brethren that we have in the church that we refer to as King James only people. And they believe that if they find fault with every newer translation, they can encourage brother to continue to use only the King James, as though it does not contain any flaws in it. Now, you can usually tell who these guys are by the way that they argue. However, uh, as at the time, I pointed out that the King James and the New King James are probably, uh, in my judgment, the two best translations that we have, the New King James being better because it doesn't have a few noteworthy flaws that the King James has, but neither is perfect. There is no perfect translation. They all have strengths and weaknesses. And, and you can go to some and passages and say, look how they translated this. This was so good. They captured uh, what, what uh, was being said. And at other times, you can scratch your head and say, why did they pick this word? This is not that good. Uh, they could have done better on this passage. So there is no perfect translation. Um, but at the time, I pointed out that the King James erroneously translated Passover as Easter in Acts chapter 12 and verse 4. And they did that because of their theology. As far as they were concerned, when the Jewish Passover came, uh, this, this coincided with Easter. And since it did in their minds, they used Easter instead of translating Passover, which is the same word. In fact, that word is used 29 times in the New Testament, and the King James translated at Passover 28. But on this occasion, they decided to put in Easter, and there is no justification for doing that. None. It is totally indefensible. Well, apparently several people must have written in to uh, Seeking the Old Paths, and pointed out that this guy was a King James only guy. So and a month or two later, he vehemently denied being a King James only guy. And then he disproved that statement by what he did next. He showed that he actually is. What did he do? He pointed out some things that people had criticized the King James for, frankly, that I've never heard anybody criticize. And he didn't deal with the most glaring mistranslation, which is Acts 12.4. Didn't deal with it at all. Didn't even try to defend it, which, of course, you can't. So, uh, to my way of thinking, he just established further the idea that he's a King James only. When I deal with the modern dangers, or the dangers of modern translations, I don't, I don't deal with things in the New American Standard or the New King James, even though they have some that could be translated better. I deal with things like the NIV, where it is shot through with error after error after error. Uh, I would never write an article uh, against the New American Standard, or uh, the American Standard, or the King James or the New King James, because those are the four best translations that we have and when we talk about the dangers of modern versions those should not even come to mind because there's so many others uh, like the new revised standard version and uh, the new international version and the paraphrases that are available those are dangerous but these are the best translations we have and so to pick on one of those is uh, kind of reveals his bias against uh, all others except 
the King James. Now we come to the fourth question for this evening. What did Jesus mean when he said, do not cast your pearls before swine? Well, before we get to Matthew 7 and verse 6, we want to look at verses 1 through 5. So if you would like to follow along with that, Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. Um, sometimes it's helpful, in fact, most of the time it's helpful when looking at a passage to read what immediately precedes it and sometimes what immediately follows it. This is the passage that everybody under the sun, including probably Buddhists or Hindus that live up on Kilimanjaro, probably know this verse. Everybody knows this verse. You hear this quoted everywhere you go. Oh, judge not that you be not judged. Uh, it would be well for people who like to quote this verse to read the next four verses that go along with it. And here's what they said. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, what does that mean? Basically, it means when you're making a judgment, don't be overly critical because you can get that right back at you. Uh, you don't want to just say a bunch of things because you feel like it. Uh, you need to have uh, some uh, basis, some warrant for what you're saying. And then he goes on, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your own eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Again, may, many times people are not very judicious when they're complaining about someone else. Uh, first of all, do you have a, the same problem or a worse problem? than the one you're complaining about with a brother or sister. So that's what Jesus is saying in this text. He is not saying don't make any judgments at all. He is pointing out that our, just, our judgments need to be fair and just. Uh, and uh, just to uh, point that out, it's John chapter 7 and verse uh, 24, where Jesus says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. You know, don't form snap conclusions. Don't look at something and say, Oh, I understand everything about that. No, you might not. There might be information that you don't have. So don't go around making judgments like that about others. But Jesus is saying, don't, don't make, he's not saying don't make any judgments at all. Judge righteous judgments. And the same is true in this passage. He's pointing out some of the flaws that people have when they make judgments on others. However, uh, Matthew 7, 1 through 5, deals with brothers. Now let's read Matthew chapter 7 and verse 6. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, uh, lest they trample them under their feet and tear you in pieces. Now, before he was talking about brothers, he uses the word brother a couple of times in Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Surely, he's, when he says dogs and swine, he's not referring to brethren, but to those who are outside of Christ, who are not capable at a particular time to receive the word. You have the right to make a judgment concerning those people. Make sure it's righteous judgment. But you have the right to make a judgment as to whom you share the gospel with. And uh, 
those that you may not share it with at a particular time. Let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, which I think maybe helps to explain the problem in this uh, that we oftentimes run into. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Have you not come across people like this? They are not incapable because they were born that way, or because they have uh, uh, no way of doing it. They're just depraved, you know, uh, and all that kind of stuff. But no, they are that way because they have no interest in spiritual things. They don't comprehend. It's not in their worldview. It's not the way they think. Their thoughts and their motives are materialistic and this worldly. They are couched in everything that goes on in this world, but they're not concerned about spiritual matters. They're not concerned about heaven or hell. They cannot imagine how anything of a spiritual nature would be of any value. To continue to try to get the gospel before these people is an exercise in futility. And it may drive them further away and invite mockery of you and of Christianity. So give it up. Don't waste your time casting pearls before swine. They, they have no appreciation. You know, if uh, the hogs are feeding and uh, they have uh, food there available and, and uh, they're uh, consuming it, and somebody throws in a pearl, do you think the pigs are going to stop and say, oh, a pearl, this has great value. No, they're just going to stomp on it. Uh, they're going to ignore it. They, they don't have anything to do with it. Uh, and the dogs that are referred to here are not like pets that people have. These are vicious dogs. Uh, they, they're the type that roam in packs and uh, can be very deadly and dangerous. Now, let me just, well, let me uh, look at uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 14 first, to notice that Jesus actually said this, in, uh, uttered this principle in another place. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse uh, uh, 14, as he is giving the instructions, to his disciples to go out on the limited commission, he says, And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust off your feet. They are not worthy. They are too natural. They're not spiritual. Don't waste your time trying to pursue them when they have basically no desire to hear anything that you have to say. Now, somebody say, oh, I don't like this idea. Okay, this does not mean give them up forever, but it does mean give them up for now. There may be things that happen in their lives, and later on they will change, and they might be amenable to hearing the gospel, but not while they're in this state. And so uh, 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 get the dust off of your feet and move on to somebody who will listen. Remember, and we don't know why, because the Bible does not explain why, just says that this is the way it was. Remember that the Spirit forbade Paul from going into Asia Minor. Remember that as they were traveling through uh, Galatia and other places? Uh, they were not allowed to go north and they were not allowed to go south. The Spirit told them not to. 
And we don't know why, but later on, Paul had his greatest work in Asia Minor, specifically with Ephesus. And the other uh, six congregations uh, were established too, and, and uh, they were thriving at the time the book of Revelation was written. But for whatever reason, they were not allowed to go there at first. I don't know if something happened to make the people think more spiritually or what, but that was the way uh, God uh, designed it in that case. It is a fact that people can change, but there's no sense in trying to reach them if the time is not right. It's like trying to teach penmanship to a three-year-old who can just barely scrawl. Come on, let's, uh, let's have some calligraphy here. Let's teach you. How... No, that's not going to happen. They're not capable of doing it at that age. Their control is not good enough. It would be like trying to offer food to those who have just left a smorgasbord. You know, uh, usually when you leave, it's kind of like, I think I pretty much handled all that I can and... Uh, my diet may not be working too well today, but nevertheless, uh, people come up to you with more food. You say, eh, I don't think so. Why? Well, you, it's just not the right time. It's not the time to do that kind of thing. You've already uh, consumed uh, as much as you uh, need and probably more than you need. But nevertheless, you, there's no appetite. So you pass it up. Try someone else. Try someone. Don't stand outside a smorgasbord trying to give away free food. Go somewhere else where people would be appreciative of receiving it. Well, that's the concept then of uh, not casting your pearls before swine. People need to have the right heart. They need to have a heart that's at least reachable. They need to have a proper spirit, uh, or at least something closer than not interested at all. And then you can get them to hear the gospel, believe it, repent of their sins, confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and be buried with him in baptism, and then make it a point to grow spiritually as they continue. This evening, if you have not begun that journey of growth and obedience, we invite you to do that. If uh, this is not of interest to you at all, that's not good. You need to consider that and uh, wonder when will be the time I will be interested in five years, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years. Oh, I won't be here in 100 years. That's right, but eternity will, and where will you be then? So you should have the proper appetite, and if we can help you develop that, if we can study with you, please let us know. If you uh, have uh, obeyed the gospel and departed from it, why not come back? And we encourage you to do that while we stand.